Hey, Todd Hampson here, and uh, I wanted to talk to you today about something that's near and dear to my heart and really should be near and dear to all believers' hearts, uh, but the past, I'd say, 10 years, five years in particular, and really the past year, I've seen it even more. Uh, it's, it's a teaching that's come under attack in some incredible ways, even saying that it doesn't exist in the Bible, and what I'm talking about is the rapture of the church. Uh, now, believe me, I understand all the key reasons why people, you know, have, have steered away from teaching about the rapture or anything related to the end times, but everywhere the rapture or the coming of the Lord is spoken about in the New Testament, it's something that all believers are supposed to look forward to. It's something that should be on our radar always from the first century to now. Um, but of late, it's kind of come under attack. Like I said, there's literally people, preachers, pastors, uh, Bible teachers saying that the, the doctrine of the rapture is not even in the Bible. Uh, so I thought it'd be a great time to kind of do a quick video, maybe 10, 15 minutes, just talking about where do we find this doctrine of the rapture? Is it in the Bible? Where is it? And what specific details can we, can we know from reading it? So I'm going to start there. Um, and I'm going to kind of go in chronological order. And the first passage where we find it it's not overtly taught, but I want to I want to go in chronological order. And the first passage where it's referenced is in one of Jesus's teachings. So that's what I want to talk about. It's his last. It's upper room discourse. You know, just before he was crucified, it was kind of like his last coach's speech to his disciples. It was a lengthy uh, passage. Uh, he talked about a lot of different things, uh, and and this follows. And this is another kind of uh, important hermeneutical or Bible study methods um, point to keep in mind is it, it's it's easy to take a verse out of context or, or read a verse and not really understand its context, but it's important to, to look at what is the chapter before talking about, what is the chapter after talking about, kind of what are the surrounding uh, verses related to a verse. And in this case, it's right after Palm Sunday, uh, chronologically speaking, Palm Sunday, the people are celebrating him, then the leaders reject him. Then, then, then Jesus says, even on this day, if you would have known what was happening, uh, you would be, you would, you would have accepted me. Basically, I'm paraphrasing there. Uh, but then we move through the week a little bit. Then we get to the upper room discourse, and he, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's he's kind of talking plainly. His disciples even say, "Now you're talking plain, plainly. You're not using figures of speech. We could, we we believe who you are." And uh, and then it brings us to this verse because he's basically preparing them for the fact of his crucifixion and resurrection and everything that's about to happen. They kind of don't realize the full weight of what's coming at them. Uh, so he starts, and I'm reading from uh, John chapter 14, the first couple of verses. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have not have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to you and... I will come back to you to be with me so that you will also be where I am. That's kind of a tongue twister. Um, so that's, that's John 14, one, one through three, one through three in my father's house. There are many rooms, you know, some of the older translations say many mansions. Uh, but what it's, when you look at the, the, the text there, it's really saying like a custom built living space that's ready for you. And what he's, what he's, uh, employing here is the very familiar Jewish wedding traditions that, the son would the 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 groom would would get engaged would go away to go back to the father's house for a period of time, build an addition for the bride on the father's house, and then when the father thought it was time, he would at in an hour known only to the father, he would send the son to go suddenly without warning fetch the bride, take her home to her new living space, uh, and also if you look carefully at the the way it's worded here, uh, some some translations even say. I will come come to you again and receive you to myself, and that's really the connotation here. That not he's coming all the way down, but he's gonna he's coming somewhere out of heaven, out of the Father's house, and he's gonna receive us and then take us to the Father's house. So I say all that because this is, I believe, the first hint to the rapture, and it's not overtly taught here, but it makes crystal clear sense when we get to these next two passages that we're gonna look at, and also again it ties in with the Jewish wedding traditions. And part of the Jewish wedding tradition, specifically in Galilee, was that, and other areas, but but especially in Galilee, 
was that the, I think it's called a ketubah, the, the bride was actually placed on an, uh, 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 kind of like a stretcher, like a nice wooden stretcher, and was carried. So she was off the ground and she was carried away to the father's house. Uh, so again, keep the rapture motif in mind and, and know that Jesus was setting it up for that. Now, again, it's not overtly taught there, but I wanted to bring that verse up because it's first chronologically and it came from the Lord Jesus' lips himself. So I wanted to kind of unpack that. The next time we bump into it, and, and a little bit of back history on Paul. Paul was, he had many mysteries revealed to him. And a mystery in the New Testament is something that was concealed in the Old Testament. You can see hints of it. Um, or it was completely absent. It wasn't even there at all. Like the church is a mystery. We, we can see where it fits in. There's some mysterious verses. Uh, there's a gap in uh, Daniel chapter 9, for example, where, where we see a, uh, something, some mysterious gap there. We now know that's the church age. Uh, but, but we didn't know it until it was revealed. And Paul, uh, at one point in his ministry, before his ministry st started, was raptured. You can read about this in some of in Paul's writings. He was taken to heaven and shown visions of everything that was to come or a lot of things that were to come. And these mysteries were, were revealed to him. And one of those mysteries was the mystery of the rapture. So Paul really is the, the prime authority on the actual doctrine of the rapture. So keep in mind what I, what I said at the outset of this video is that there's Bible teachers actually out there right now saying that the rapture is not even taught in the Bible. So I want to read these next two passages that are overtly teach the rapture just to debunk that and just so that you know where these these verses are if you hear that argument or you hear somebody trying to say the rapture is not taught in the bible uh the first one's first corinthians uh, 15 51 through 52 uh, and actually chronologically speaking the next passage in first thess was actually written that was one of paul's earliest writings first and second thessalonians so chronologically uh i i, I probably should go there first but i want to i want to go here with in first Corinthians because it, it gives again some insights on the resurrection that will that are needed to understand when when we get to the teaching of the actual rapture where we get play by play what happens in the rapture so the context of first Corinthians again context is key is all about the resurrection will there be a resurrection and what is what is it going to be like and that kind of thing so uh, just a couple verses here first Corinthians 15 51 through 52 Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Uh, okay. So think carefully about that chronology and the details. And I'm going to go through that slowly again. I tell you a mystery. Again, this is a mystery that Paul was given to teach the church. Um, he was designated as the, the Gentile uh, missionary, so to speak, to take the gospel to the whole world. So he was given these church age mysteries. We will not all sleep. Sleep everywhere in the New Testament when you're talking to believers is a reference to death. And I think it's a cool reference to death because basically we're not dying. We fall asleep. You close our eyes on this side of eternity and you wake up on the other side of eternity. You, you close your eyes and open and you see Jesus. So we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. I want to point out, we will all be changed. I get this question sometimes. Will some believers who are not living faithfully for the Lord be left behind at, at the rapture? Um, no, we're all saved by grace. None of us deserve it. Um, when you get into uh, kind of what we did for the Lord or, or what our motives were after we were saved, that's more a judgment seat of Christ or Bema seat question about the rewards we get eternal rewards but that has nothing to do with salvation this is this verse is very clear all believers all people have who have placed their their trust in christ at the moment of the rapture will be taken uh, we will not all sleep but we will all be changed and what it's talking about being changed there it's being changed into our glorified resurrected bodies in an instant um, right now our bodies can't handle what's in heaven we would explode on impact <laughs> We, our, our, our brains couldn't handle, our ears couldn't handle the sounds, our eyes couldn't handle the sights, uh, our heart couldn't handle the emotion. Um, so God's, God's preparing us for, it, it's almost like a, you know, a caterpillar into a butterfly. He's preparing us for something much, much greater that we can't even imagine. 
So we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Um, that word there is, is, I think it's atomos or something, something similar to that. It has the idea of an atom. It's the, the smallest amount of time possible when you can't divide time anymore. Uh, so it's instantaneous. It's not a long, drawn-out thing. It's going to happen in a snap. Uh, at the last trumpet. So we're given there the first mention of that a trumpet will be involved, some kind of heavenly trumpet. And we'll look at that more in depth in the next um, set of verses. It says, For the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable. So first, those who have already died and gone before us as believers will be raised from the grave and receive their glorified spiritual bodies. I've heard some people joke and say, well, they get to be raised first because they're, they're six feet deeper, so it's going to take them a little, little longer to get up. Um, but anyway, the, the dead will be raised imperishable, and then we will be changed. So we who are alive are, will be changed instantly after they're raised. Uh, so the rapture is the resurrection. It is a New Testament believers thing, and it's going to happen in an instant at an unknown moment that only the Father knows. Um, so now I want to take you to, here's the, here's the play by play, slow mo detailed version of the rapture. And it's found in first Thessalonians four. This is the key, the primary, uh, most detailed passage of the rapture, um, which proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible teaches there's a rapture. Uh, if those other two didn't convince you, but there we read and, and what the, the Thessalonian believers were wrestling with was several things but they were confused by some erroneous teaching but also they were facing persecution and a lot of their uh, fellow believers have had been died or even martyred during this tough time so they they're they're asking paul well what about the resurrection what about the you know the believers these believers that have died i thought the lord was coming back soon so paul kind of comforts them with this and he starts in, in verse 13 uh, there's some lead-in verses before that, but if you read 13 through 18, you'll get the gist of it. And he, there he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Again, you see right there, sleep is correlated to death. As believers, we don't fear, fear death. It's just going to sleep. We have eternity to look forward to. There's nothing about death that should uh, cause us to fear. Uh, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. What an encouragement that is to those of us who have had believers in our family or friends that have gone on before us that we grieve, we miss them. It's, you know, especially if it's a tough situation or it seems they're taken before their time, maybe they were younger or it was a, it was a, a tough disease or sudden tragedy. We grieve, we, we, we cry, we weep with those who weep, but we don't grieve the way the world grieves. We don't grieve in a hopeless way. We know that this is not the end. We know that we're gonna see them again. So another glorious aspect of the rapture is it's a reunion with believers who have gone before us, uh, including old, you know, believe, believe, we'll see Old Testament believers, we'll see uh, Paul, you know, all that stuff. We'll get to meet and talk to all these people we read about in the Bible, which is amazing. Um, but anyway, uh, we don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. The resurrection is key. It proves that everything he said that was going to happen in the end times fulfilled prophecy and the resurrection proved that his plan is going to play out exactly as foretold. Uh, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So those who die now uh, or, or the whole church age who have died are with the Lord in spirit. At the moment of the rapture, which is the New Testament resurrection, the church age resurrection, they will be reunited with their glorified spiritual body. So there's no soul sleep. There's no, uh, you know, nothing like that. No purgatory. They're with the Lord. Believers who have died are with the Lord in spirit form awaiting the resurrection of the body. Uh, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Again, this mirrors the, the first Corinthians passage that those who have died and gone before us will be raised first, then we'll be caught up. Uh, it says, for the Lord himself. So this is pretty personal. Jesus himself is coming. Again, remember, when the father knows it's time, he sends the son to go fetch the bride. And it, the, it's a whole wedding motif. It's a whole marriage consummation motif when you get to the book of Revelation with the church in heaven. 
Um, so everything lines up perfectly. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. So three noises that I believe all believers will hear. I, I, I don't think unbelievers will hear it. I think it'll be similar to when Paul uh, was on the road to Damascus and Jesus spoke to him, the, the people around him, nobody saw the light, nobody heard the voice but it was loud enough to knock Paul off his horse. In this case, it's going to be loud enough to raise the dead, raise the dead and cause us to be changed and to rise with them. Um, but the Lord himself personally comes down from heaven with a loud command. What will that command be? I don't know. Uh, maybe it's going to be like he told um, Lazarus, 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 come forth. Church, come forth. Bride, it's time to come home. Uh, you know, that kind of thing with the voice of an archangel what is that voice going to be maybe it's the archangel is kind of like maybe like the bridegroom in the the wedding uh motif he's he's announcing the coming of the groom you know get ready for the groom we're coming to get you we we don't know we're not told so i'm speculating here all, all we know is there's a loud command from the lord and and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of god some kind of heavenly trumpet that's going to be unmistakable uh, in the Old Testament, trumpets were used for two things, to gather people to assembly and to prepare people for battle. Uh, this is both of those. It's gathering God's church age believers, his bride. And it's also, remember, this is uh, the, uh, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the God, lowercase g, of this age. So this is his territory right now. So this is an invasion into enemy territory. Jesus, the Lord himself, is coming into enemy territory in the air, the, remember, the prince of the power of the air, to snatch his bride out. Uh, so, it, so the trumpet, trumpet lines up with both of those. So uh, with, the, with the trumpet call of God and the dead, of, dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. So that tells us exactly where he's going to meet us. Uh, just like he, Jesus alluded to in that, that first passage from John 14, that he's coming again to receive us, again, wedding language, uh, in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Um, now we'll be with the Lord in heaven. Then we come back and then there's the millennial kingdom and then there's the eternal state. That's a topic for another day. But from this point forward, we will always be with the Lord. We never have to worry about separation. We never will be in sinless, glorified bodies from that point through all eternity. What an amazing thing to look forward to, which is why we get this next verse, verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This doctrine of the rapture should give every believer so much hope, so much joy. Uh, and I believe in the pre-trib rapture, which means we're taken out of here prior to um, the, the time of tribulation on the earth. And I recently, I think I did a video and I have a blog post about the seven top reasons I believe in a pre-trib rapture. Um, but here's just a couple to uh, mention to you. Uh, the church is not appointed to wrath. First Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10 and 5, 9. Um, believers will not be overtaken or surprised by the day of the Lord. Sorry. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 9. Um, and the church of Philadelphia was promised to be to be taken to be kept from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world, and that's Revelation three ten. And again, that word is ek. It's the Greek word that means taken out of, not not preserved through or carried through or protected. It literally means the church is taken out of here, and it specifically says before the hour or the time of trial that's coming on the whole world. So it's clearly talking about the day of the Lord. The, the, the time of God's wrath on, on earth. Um, so anyway, encouraging things. And the, the timing of the rapture is not a, not a salvation thing at all. Um, technically, the belief in a rapture is not a salvation thing. People can maybe be uninformed or a new Christian, and maybe they didn't hear about the rapture yet, um, but they accepted the Lord. And uh, accepting the Lord, knowing Christ, having your sins forgiven, that's what saves us. This other stuff is secondary, but it's very important. And the main thing I'm trying to get across is that the rapture is clearly, crystal clearly taught in scripture. So if you hear that argument that the rapture is not in the Bible or it's not taught in scripture, uh, just know that these verses we just went over disprove that by strides and, and crystal clear. There's no way people can say 
with a straight face after looking at these verses that the rapture is not taught in the Bible. Uh, so anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Hope you learned a little bit and um, share this with people. Like, share, subscribe. Um, we really want to make this uh, accessible to as many people as possible. We're trying to uh, kind of put handles on theology in a way that people can grab it, learn from it, and be confident in what they've been taught and be able to look in their own Bibles and see what we're teaching. So please share this uh, with as many people as you can, and I will talk to you again soon. Take care.